Now, again, just looking at the background again to remind us what's going on in this church. Within the Corinthian church, there was a struggle going on. On the outward, it looked like there was a small group of people, what we called last week the the vocal minority, who had said disparaging things about the Apostle Paul, the person who planted the church. On the surface of things, as far as you could tell by outward appearances, it might have been there was some personality struggles going on within this church. Uh, whatever you want to call it, there was some sort of struggle. But beneath the surface of things, Paul saw it for what it really was, and he referred to it last week, uh, and we saw how it was a spiritual struggle. In Ephesians chapter 6, he, he, he coins those famous words, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual beings, spiritual forces. And these spiritual forces have a way of putting thoughts in people's minds, pushing people's buttons, stirring people up. Doesn't happen just in church, happens in our own lives. People out of nowhere sometimes just come at us, and there is a spiritual element. The last thing these Corinthian Christians w- would have thought was that the divisive thinking that was going on in their church had its original source within demonic powers. And Paul's opposition, they not only tore him down and attacked him, but they also were doing something else that he's going to point out this week in this chapter. They were boasting about themselves. They were bragging about themselves. And that seemed to be a real character flaw in these false teachers, and he calls them false teachers. Um, they boasted. They bragged about their talents. And there's a certain, pri- a pri- a certain pride. That's, they were puffed up, if you will. Uh, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7, Paul, he puts, and I'm reminding you, and it's been a long time since we've looked at this, but he said in 1 Corinthians 4 7, who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not? He's talking about giftings, you know, people who have a certain gifting and a certain talent, you know, you have that gift, you have that talent because God has given it to you or helped you develop it over the years. And if God did it, why are you taking credit for it, going around and bragging, look at me? For example, some of these people might have, in that church, Corinthian church, had the incredible ability to speak and to teach. And Paul says, hey, you can't take credit for it because it puts the focus on you rather than giving God the glory. And this is something as Christians we have to learn in our walk with the Lord if we're going to grow. You know, to learn to give God credit and glory for giftings and abilities that we have. In the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, love does not boast. You know, it's, love is not prideful. Last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul said, let him who boasts, boast in what? Boast in the Lord. Yeah, boast, if you're going to brag and boast about something. So this morning in this chapter, Paul will say that boasting is really a form of foolishness. It's folly. So let's dive into the chapter this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, I hope you will put up with a little of my foolishness, but you are already doing that. <laughs> Bragging about yourself is foolishness, is what Paul's going to get around to saying here. So Paul says, hey, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. I'm going to say it reluctantly, It's a fool's game, but let me play the part of a fool by boasting about my credentials. Because you guys are, he's saying, you're basically attacking me, the Apostle Paul, and you're holding up the credentials and the accomplishments of these so-called false teachers, as Paul calls them. So Paul says, they have no problem boasting and bragging. I guess I got to enter into this foolish game of bragging about myself. Verse 2, I am jealous for you, with a godly jealousy, I promised you to one husband or betrothed you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Now I'm reading out of the NIV this morning. Some of you have the ESV or other translations, but it says the same thing, just in different order. Uh, he's talking about, you know, being jealous. Being jealous usually is not a good character trait. 
I don't know if you struggle with jealousy or someone you know struggles with jealousy. On a human level, often it is a sign of someone's insecurity or something not being right in a relationship that produces jealousy. Um, on a divine level, it refers to God being jealous. And godly jealousy is a, it's actually a character trait of God that is a good trait. Why is that? Well, in the Old Testament, God called himself a jealous God. I used to read that as a new believer and go, wow, is God like insecure that he's jealous? Do you remember reading that in the Old Testament? God's a jealous God, right? And I didn't really, and I just sort of put it away and I've heard different explanations until I went to India. And then I realized why God calls himself a jealous God. You know, we live in this monotheistic culture for the most part. But when you go to a country that has millions of gods, literally millions of gods, and then you start telling these people and you're sharing with people, you know, about believing in the Lord, they'll say, okay, sure, why not? I'll just add another god on my fireplace mantle. Or I'll put another one outside my door and burn a candle to him. And then you got to say, no, 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 hold on here. This God says me and me only, as in you have to get rid of all the other gods because he's a jealous God. And then, you know, the real test starts to happen. Now, if you don't understand that polytheistic culture where there's people worshiping hundreds of gods and we're used to just ours, God being a jealous God, well, what's that all about? But remember, the Old Testament was written in a time when culture was what? It was very much into polytheism. Right? Many gods. Anyways, God says he's a jealous God. He was jealous for the affection and the loyalty of his people. And it carries on from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Well, if you look at God's Old Testament people, Israel often strayed spiritually after other gods, and God called it spiritual adultery. In the New Testament, as Christians, we are part of the body of Christ. We're part of the bride of Christ. And Paul's desire as, apostle, as an apostle, as a shepherd, was to present believers to Jesus Christ. Now, in this particular church, Paul saw himself as the spiritual father of these Corinthians, of this church. And he saw this church as, his spiritual da- as a spiritual daughter that was betrothed, promised to Jesus. And so he says, it's my responsibility to help you keep focused on Jesus, your one true love. That's kind of what he's getting at here. That's what he says in this verse. Verse 3 goes on and says, Paul says, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Last week we saw how the mind is a battlefield it's an arena of ideas and as we saw last week the corinthian christians were being misled in their thinking okay in chapter 10 we saw that there you know the word of god the knowledge of god kept them pure and focused on jesus their one true love but there was also false knowledge out there false arguments false thoughts false pretensions about god When Eve was in the garden, she was misled by the serpent. When she first came across Satan, I don't think she looked at Satan and said, oh, there's there's Satan, God's arch enemy. She didn't think that. No. All she saw was this serpent who was very cunning, very smart, very intelligent, very stealth in the form of a serpent, not an angel like Poof. All right, with horns and stuff like that and flames coming from it. No, no, no. Very, very cunning. And he planted thoughts in uh, Eve's mind, you know, like, look at that fruit. Oh, yeah, look at that fruit. It's really appealing. It's very desirable to eat. It looks tasty. And, in, and then he put the thought, if you eat it, it will make you like God. All right? Now, I want you to notice a phrase here. Look, look it says, your pure and simple devotion. Verse 3, I think it is, I just read. Your pure and simple devotion to Jesus pure and simple devotion to Christ. That phrase, I think, is a loaded phrase. It meant something very powerful to Paul. Why is that? Well, you see, 
like Eve, the Corinthian Christians started off on the right foot, but they were being led down the garden path just like Adam and Eve were. The path, it starts off just by little, little, little deviation. Paul spent a year and a half with these guys. They were, they were in great shape to start off with. A master disciple maker. But then they started to deviate. And you know, guys, listen. You can start off amazingly well with the Lord. But down the road, you got to still stay faithful and pure to your simple devotion to Jesus because you can rest in your laurels, if you will, your past victories. I had great spiritual highs with the Lord. You don't know how amazing my experiences were with the Lord five years ago. Man, how could I be wrong now? Well, guess what? Adam and Eve started off pretty good too. They were hanging out with God all the time. Face-to-face walks in the Garden of Eden. The Corinthians had Paul, the master disciple maker. But little by little, Satan deceived them. They cooled off in their walk with the Lord. They started to drift little by little. When Paul started with these Corinthian Christians, if you read in the book of Acts, he, he, he had just come from the city of Athens where he, was, he gave that famous address up on Mars Hill where all the philosophers taught in Greece on Athens, on Mars Hill. And he quoted some of the writings when he was up there. And he, he looked well-read and educated. And some people look at that and say, well, he was trying to appeal to their culture, speak to where they're at. You know, I'm quoting your po- poet. One of your poets said, in him we live and move and have our being. That's a quote from a secular po- one of their poets. I see you worship this unknown God. Well, let me tell you about this unknown God. And there's some people say, well, that's a really good way to reach out to where people are at. And others say, Paul bombed. What do you mean? Well, there was only a few people that believed in Jesus when Paul had finished in Athens. And, and, and so, you know, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about coming to the Corinthians in fear and trembling and being humbled and, and being weak. And I think when Paul left Athens, no matter how you look at it, he felt very kind of, I, I didn't have a big impact there. Small group of people. And he comes into Corinth, Sin City, and in Corinth, you know, he drops the fancy stuff, and he says he just preached Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I resolved to know nothing when I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When Paul came into the city of Corinth, he said, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the cross and the resurrection. The cross and the simplicity of Jesus. And so I think when Paul says, guys, we need to focus on the simplicity and the pure devotion of Jesus, I, you know, listen, the Corinthians were getting polluted with false ideas, false thoughts, false beliefs, uh, not the good news, but fake news. We hear a lot about fake news nowadays, by the way, okay? Um, this is the first place maybe where fake news really happened. Anyways, verse 4 goes on, and 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, this is what Paul says, For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Did you hear what I just said there? Paul says, hey, when somebody comes to you and you're, they're preaching a different Jesus, different doctrines, things totally r- different and opposite of what I've been teaching, you guys are willing to receive that person. You're willing to put up with it. And here's the thing. There's, something, there's some grit in Paul that we need to build into our backbones as Christians. There is only one Jesus in the Bible. There is only one correct idea of Jesus in the Bible. There's only one correct representation of Jesus. And if you look uh, other times in, in the Bible, Paul talks about that. He says in Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. There's only one image. There's many images in the world. There's a lot of people who will tell you this is what I think Jesus is like. But there's only one true image. The rest are false images. The rest are idols. Anybody tells you what Jesus, other than what you see in the Bible, they're, they're, they're idol peddlers. They're pushing idols. It's a false god. Hebrews 1.3 says Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's being. All right? John 1.1, 1, 1, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, says Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. The Word, 
The Greek word there is logos, the, 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 the logos of God, the logic of God. He's the wisdom of God, the intellect of God, the desire, everything you want to know about God in thought form that you could possibly think of is in Jesus. Jesus was God. He is God. He's one with the Father. And so let me just say it clearly here. Let's be very clear, guys. Everything you need to know about God the Father is seen perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ. You don't need to go outside of Jesus, period. That is what Scripture teaches about Jesus. Now, interesting, I talked to a guy this week. He says, he says, Ed, I just had a visit from these two young girls. I think they were from this, and he, t- you know, and he tells me, and he says, these, these girls were so nice. They were so incredibly nice to me. I, and I, I, and I said, okay, what, would they ask you out for a date or something or what? what? He says, no, no, they were so nice to me. And then I found out they were Mormon missionaries. And they invited me to their church. And I was almost tempted to go, you know. And I said, yeah, but, you know, I mean, why did you want to go? He says, well, they were just so, he says, why are they so nice? And, you know, I, I, had, I said, look, here's the deal, man. The Mormons, they teach a different Jesus. They teach that Jesus and Lucifer were one time brothers. And Lucifer and Jesus approached God the Father, Elohim, all right, as they call him, and they presented their different plans on how to redeem the world. And after doing that, God the Father, Elohim, picked Jesus' plan over Lucifer's plan, Satan's plan, and Since that time, Jesus and Lucifer have been at war and at odds with each other ever since. And I said, you know, they preach a different Jesus. You can't find that anywhere in this book. I don't care how many times you read this book cover to cover. It's not in there. And then, you know, that's a different Jesus. And then there's another group, you know, that says, well, Jesus, before he came to earth, was actually the archangel Michael. Do you know who is that? King, the Kingdom Hall, that's right. They teach that Jesus was recreated, or Michael, the archangel, was recreated into the person of Jesus, which makes him not God, by the way. It just makes him an angel recreated. And then when he went back to heaven, he was recreated back into uh, the archangel Michael. Now listen, guys, I don't care how many times you read this. You cannot find that in this book. It is impossible to find that in this book, Period. There is not one verse that even gets close to that. It's a different Jesus. And so Paul says, hey, you Corinthians, when someone comes preaching to you a different Jesus, you have no problem with it. You're okay with it. You put up with the guy. Really. He says, you guys need to get some something in your backbone here and say no to these people when they come knocking on your door. Verse 5. But I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. Super apostles. He's not referring to the original 12 apostles that walked with Jesus. You know, Peter, James, John. In this verse, verse 5, these super apostles that he's talking about, he's referring to the false teachers who are in Crete, Corinth presenting a different Jesus, bragging about themselves. Verse 6 goes on. I may not be a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have this, we have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Part of the problem in Corinth was the philosophies of the time, 2,000 years ago, were creeping into the church. And a big part of being a philosopher back then, and this is important, a big part of being a philosopher back then was being a persuasive public speaker, a powerful public speaker. You were trained how to take little bits of knowledge and turn them into persuasive arguments and then turn those arguments into strong developed concepts, kind of like a lawyer making his case in a courtroom, okay? And so that's what these these, these philosophers were like. So Paul says, I don't have the philosophical, rhetorical training that these so-called teachers that are influencing you. But he says, you know what? I do have knowledge. 
When I came to you, I, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And guys, you know, there is a difference between someone who has abilities to stand up in front of people and speak, and they, they put these incredible masterpiece messages in front of people, and somebody who actually has a personal relationship with the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, there's nothing wrong with using training and gifting and ability and communicating your idea in well put out thought. Don't get me wrong. I think it's important to prepare. All right? When I hear people who don't prepare, it sounds like the same sermon after about the fourth or fifth time. You know what I'm saying? Because they just repeat the same thing over time. You got to get up there prepared. There's no doubt about it. But it's kind of like there's a difference, though, between that and the the, 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 rhetor the rhetorical trained speakers in Corinth and Athens of the day. I'm reminded of the story of the, the dinner party. And uh, at the end of this dinner party, and I hate these kind of dinner parties, but at the end of the dinner party, everybody had to get up and recite something uh, for the rest of the group, kind of like at a wedding reception, all right, which you'll never get me to get up and stand up and say something. But anyways, all right, but there was this famous actor, and he stood up at the end of the dinner party, and he recited the 23rd Psalm, and he did it with dramatic flair. He did it with emotion. He had the right things in his voice. He, he just said things, and everybody just, you know, heard it, and they, 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 were, they applauded it. Well, then another guy, two seats down, stood up, and all he had was the 23rd Psalm, just like the other guy. And so he got up, and he uh, spoke the 23rd Psalm. He wasn't very eloquent. And at first, people listened, and they thought it was a little bit funny. But then, because his presentation was straight from the heart, when he sat down, people there was a bit of a respectful silence. And the actor came up and said to the, the, the fellow that uh, said the 23rd Psalm the second time, he says, you know, I know the psalm, but you know the shepherd. There is a dramatic difference. Do you hear me? And then just having knowledge in your head versus a personal relationship with the Lord, where that knowledge comes out, and the Holy Spirit uses it. True theology is the knowledge of God set on fire by the Holy Spirit. Okay? You hear what I'm saying? It's not a bunch of head knowledge. That's where the church has gotten in trouble. We, you know, just filling our heads with facts. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and not to be afraid of it. Paul's knowledge was a personal. He knew Jesus. All right, verse 7 goes on. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? What's he talking about here? Well, back then, in that culture, the greater the admission price a speaker could charge showed the greater worth and importance of that speaker. How much did Paul charge when he preached the gospel? Nothing. <laughs> All right? And that was part of the problem of that culture and what he was dealing with. He was showing servanthood. He preached without financial benefit. And the false teachers, they probably charge big time or they ask people for big time. And so Paul says, I came to you as a servant to minister to you. And he took the position of a servant, a slave. He humbled himself. He lowered himself. Guys, servanthood is a rare quality. It was misunderstood in that culture. It was something that you didn't go around saying, I want to be a servant and look like a servant. It was the opposite back then. Guys, in our culture... I think it's still kind of like that, but in the church, it's hard to sort of build this into the DNA of a Christian to be a servant. It takes a long time to become a servant. Hey, we need to stack these chairs. <sighs> Why are you asking me, man? Don't ask me. That just cramping my, I just had a great service in church. I feel really good. Now you're asking me to stack some chairs. No, and I'm not asking anybody to stack chairs. We don't have to stack chairs. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not setting you up or anything here, okay? I'm just telling you. We may have this incredible disconnect between our theology and our character. All right? God calls us to do things with our knowledge. All right, verse 8. We're going to start moving through this chapter a little quicker. He says, I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. So Paul is basically saying, hey, 
You guys didn't support me while I was in Crint. Other churches were supporting me. You know, think about that. Verse 9 goes on and he says, And when I was with you, you needed some, um, with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. They were really questioning Paul's motives. And Paul says, you know, how can you question motives? I, I worked with you guys for a year and a half and I didn't, I didn't, other churches were supporting me while I was there. Verse 10, as surely as the truth of Christ is in me, Nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. <laughs> so Achaia, we saw a couple weeks ago, was uh, south to the south of Corinth. A and he said, Paul says, no one's going to stop this boasting that I served you freely and didn't receive anything. Verse 11, he says, why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. So Paul was saying basically, that, you know, the Corinthians, they thought they, they were being smart by not supporting Paul. And Paul turns around and he says, thank God I didn't get a nickel from you, those Corinthians. I'm serving them in a way that's beyond any question of motive. You can't question my motive in any way, shape, or form. All right. And then we get to verse 12 and he says, and I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. So these false teachers, they were throwing mud at Paul, and Paul is cutting the ground out from underneath them, saying, look, look how much you're paying me. You're not paying me anything, so you know what my motives are. It has nothing to do with money. All right, verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. So now we're starting to get into some serious confrontation here. Paul is calling them, he says they're masquerading. They're deceitful. All right? They're not true apostles. Verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Wow. People who teach and preach a false Jesus are actually, you know, they're masquerading as something true. But Paul is basically saying they're representatives of Satan who, who masquerades as an, as, a, as an angel of light. You know, when Satan comes to you, he doesn't, like, put on a black cloak with red horns and smoke coming out of his nostrils. No, he's looking like the real deal. He's looking like he's amazing. The most deceptive lie is the lie that has some truth in it. And the more truth that a lie has in it, the more the little bit is bad. Satan doesn't appear as this incredible, fearsome-looking demon. He, peer, he appeared as a serpent, a snake in camouflage. He masquerades. Verse 15. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. I know it sounds really harsh, guys, when we read stuff like this. That God would actually judge and deal with people who spend their whole life based on a deception, preaching a false Jesus. In the church, Satan's servants don't go around, like I say, wearing long black robes, a lot of times they're actually carrying Bibles. They sing songs. But the test is in their actions. Isn't that what Paul says here? Their fruit. What is their fruit? And of course, I, I, I do mean love, joy, peace, patience, the character of Jesus. But then what's their message? Are they talking about Jesus? The simplicity of Jesus? When they knock on the door, is it talking about the cross and the resurrection of Jesus? Or do they got to get you to read some book other than the Bible? All right? Is it always about money? Because there's another version within the Christian church where they don't really, you know, come across all that bad. But they're always talking about money when you turn and listen to them on the TV. It's always about money, money, money. You need to give money to this ministry. And, you know, and when you hear them, are they talking about things that you would never discover simply just by reading the Bible on your own? Ask yourself that. All right? 
What's the fruit? Verse 16. Paul says, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool. But if you do, then receive me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little bit of boasting. (laughs) So the false preachers were boasting about things according to their standards. They boasted about their ability to speak. And Paul says, you know, here's the real test. Verse 17. In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. So Paul says, I'm talking as a fool would. All right? So this boasting, you know, don't take this as a pattern for yourself to fall, follow, but I'm boasting here, and it's being foolish because these are what these other guys are doing, and so I'm just trying to show you something here. Verse 18. He goes on, he says, since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You know, the world has no problem boasting and bragging about their abilities, their accomplishments. Um, The world lifts up human personality, boasting about human accomplishments, human education, degrees, and all the rest of it. The other kind of boasting is boasting about the Lord, boasting about the name of Jesus, focusing on the pure simplicity, pureness of Jesus. And I think, guys, as a church, we have, the Christian church as a whole, we've gotten into this education and degrees and all these things. And I'm not knocking down education and getting training and, you know, becoming this or that or all these things. But the power of the church is not all that stuff from the world. The power of the church is the name of Jesus, the cross, the resurrection, the power of the Holy Spirit. And we seem to be afraid about talking about the power of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Verse 19. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. I think this is called sarcasm here. He says you have so many fools in your church in Corinth. Let's have another fool by the name of Paul. All right. Verse 20. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you, or takes advantage of you, or pushes himself forward, or slaps you in the face. This is usually a sign of a bad situation. When the people in charge of the church are abusive to people in the church. Oh, I've never seen that. Yeah, you know what? It happens. It happens here in London. All right? False teachers, at different times, they're abusive. It's another sign. False servants, a lot of times, are on a power trip. They beat the sheep or from the front. They use guilt trips or they use manipulation tactics to get money from people or to get people to do things or put them under a certain yoke. Do you hear what I'm saying? And it's out there, all right? They fleece the flock. That's what a false teacher does. Verse 21, Paul says, To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. This is kind of hard to follow if this is the first time you guys have read this. Paul says, you know, as an apostle, I was meek. And we saw last week how the Corinthians said, well, meekness is weakness. Paul, you're so strong in your letters. But when you come and meet us face to face, you're very meek and humble. And they criticized them for that. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. And so verse 21 goes on. Let me read verse 21. To my shame, I admit that we too were, we were too weak for that, for being tough with you and pushing you around. What anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. All right. So Paul says, I can boast too. And so what's his boasting? Well, Uh, what's his boast? What's his credentials as an apostle? Well, believe it or not, you want to know what Paul boasts about? He doesn't boast about his incredible education that he had in the past or all these things. You know what his boasting is? And he's going to, this this is the one, we're going to get into the best best part of the chapter here, all right? The best part of the chapter is coming up. Paul's boasting is going to be about his scars. Paul's boasting is going to be about his war stories, in preaching the gospel. So let's look at it. Verse 22 gets going here. Paul says, and he's he's comparing himself to these false teachers. He says, are they Hebrews? Well, I'm a Hebrew too, he says. Are they Israelites? 
Well, so am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? Well, so am I. So in the early church, do you remember there was this false movement of Judaizers going through all the Gentile churches? They were Jewish Christians who were saying, well, before you become a Christian, you have to become a Jewish person first. Before you, before you can become a Christian and believe in Jesus, you really should get circumcised. You need to follow this law and that law. And so it wasn't just simply believing in Jesus and being born again. They had all this stuff, okay? That was the problem in the early church. And Paul says, okay, these false teachers that are corrupted, you guys, they think they're so incredibly important. Well, guess what? I have the same background. Verse 23, are they servants of Christ? And in brackets, I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. So these super apostles were flaunting their ability and their worldly successes, their ability to speak, charging great sums of money, saying you need to give us lots of money. And Paul says, I walked amongst you as a humble guy. You didn't pay me any money. And then he goes on, and look what he says here. Look at verse 20. Well, let's read verse 24. He says, okay, I was exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. 40 lashes minus one. Under the Old Testament law, uh, a punishment was 40 lashes. And the Jewish people, after that was written, said, okay, let's do 40. When we lash somebody, let's hit them 40 times minus one. We, in case we forget the count and we hit the guy one too many times. So that's why, for, that's why you see the phrase 40 minus one, lashes, okay? So, he says, I was punished five different, imagine being whipped five different occasions. Five different occasions, he was whipped by his fellow countrymen. Verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. When it says he was beaten by rods, that was how the Roman authorities would treat you and they would punish you and he says i got hit beat three times you know guys sometimes i wonder if i had have gotten whipped once i would say where is god maybe i'm not really that loved by god for god to let that happen to me because as a christian everything's supposed to be amazing and that's what i signed up for when i became a christian that everything would go good. Paul says, I got whipped five different occasions and then beaten with rods on three different occasions. <laughs> uh, stoned. You can read about that in the book of Acts. They stoned him, and I imagine left him under this pile of rocks. And I'm going to talk more about that in the future in 2 Corinthians because Paul talks about a time when he died and went to heaven. And I kind of think that's when it happened. When he was stoned. And the Lord brought him back. Three times I was shipwrecked. <laughs> I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Clinging on to debris. Hoping someone would come along and rescue me. Well it keeps getting better. Verse 26. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers. In danger from bandits in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the sea, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger in the city, sorry, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. So if you came here this morning complaining about the neighbor who across the street that's giving you a hard time or they looked at you the wrong way or they didn't wave when you did waved at them and you're feeling, man, my whole week has been wrecked. Read what Paul went through <laughs> in this chapter, okay? If you think you've had a rough week, look at what Paul had to go through. You hear what I'm saying? If you have a pity party, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and read what Paul went through. Verse 28, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. 
It's a hard thing to understand what that means unless you are in charge of a number of churches and you're overlooking a number of churches and you have a concern about them staying on the right path. Verse 29. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led to, into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Paul's being very honest here, guys. Paul was tempted, just like everybody else. And he had to put those temptations in place. Verse 30. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. In other words, Paul says, if I'm going to go around boasting, I'm going to boast about the things that show me as weak. That is not normal. That is not the way things are done in this world. All right? And we're going to look at that next week more in depth. But what does God promise to people that humble themselves? Humble yourself before the Lord and he'll do what? He will exalt you. He will lift you up. We're going to look a little bit about that, what that looks like in the, you know, um, well, it's next week I think it is. All right? Kind of exciting. All right, verse 31. Well, let's read on. 31. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Eretas had the city of Damascus guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. <laughs> All right, let's stop there. If you've ever been on the run and had to get out of town, and you were lowered over the wall in a basket at nighttime through a hole in the wall. I guess you wouldn't understand what Paul is going through here. I've never had that kind of thing happen to me. But I'll tell you something. You know, sometimes as Christians, you know, we come to church, and we're supposed to worship the Lord like we are at the beginning of the morning. But we wonder, you know, how come my Christian life is so boring? How come it's this? Well, I think a lot of times you got to step out in faith and do something for the Lord. And you end up with these war stories. I love, re this is Paul's war stories here. He's not bragging about his education. He's not bragging about his incredible accomplishments. He says, look what I went through, the persecutions, the difficulties. That is the proof I'm still faithful. I'm still serving the Lord. And so this morning, guys, you know, I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you're here this morning. You've had a rough week. You've had a rough month. You've had a rough year. Maybe you got someone giving you a hard time. I don't know what it is, but God promises you this. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. God promises you, be honest with him about your weaknesses. God pro and, and, and what he'll do is he will invest his strength into you. God is glorified when we say, look at me, I got nothing to offer. I need you to work through me. And so this morning, guys, I think what we need to do is be like Paul here this morning and say, Lord, I am weak. I may be struggling with sin. I burn within. And he says that. I burn within. I haven't committed sin, but I'm incredibly tempted in certain areas. Things haven't worked out a lot of different times. It looked like it was working wrong, but I still was faithful to the Lord. And I think he still cried out for God, Lord, I want to be committed to Jesus, the simplicity of Jesus. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your presence. So this morning, let's just wait upon the Lord this morning. And say, Lord, I pray you do a new work in me. Father, we come to you right now.